Good afternoon. It is fantastic that we get to gather together this afternoon and celebrate how our God has continued to preserve his word throughout the ages. We're celebrating the Reformation, but the reality is that the Reformation is only a small part of the history of the Christian church in the 500 years before that, because God has been doing his thing since the very beginning, from the Garden of Eden, where he promised to Adam and Eve that there was going to be a savior that came, then for thousands of years, his word endured and his promises endured until it was all fulfilled 2,000 years ago on Calvary for us through Christ and his death, and then three days later through his resurrection. And then for 2,000 years more, our God continues to preserve his word. This is absolutely amazing to reflect on. And then we get to celebrate how he did it, especially for us, the heirs of the Lutheran Reformation. I invite you to turn to the very first page, and we have some opening words there. Please stand. Two years ago, we celebrated the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. The year 1517 is the date chosen for the start of the Reformation because it was the year Luther was first widely recognized as challenging the current teaching of the Catholic Church when he nailed his 95 theses to a cathedral in Wittenberg. But that was the very first of many important events of the Reformation. Today, we celebrate the 500th year anniversary of Sola Scriptura, of the church rediscovering that our spiritual authority is based on scripture and scripture alone. In the year 1519, Luther took part in what is now known as the Leipzig debate, the first major debate of the Reformation. The debate ended in Luther establishing publicly that the papacy and councils were subject to error and doctrine could only be established on God's word alone. Years later, in one of the Lutheran confessions, our position was stated in the following, join with me as we reaffirm our centeredness on the Bible alone as our source of life, truth, and gospel hope. We receive and embrace with our whole heart the prophetic and apostolic scriptures of the Old and New Testaments as the pure, clear foundation of Israel, which is the only true standard by which all teachers and doctrines are to be judged. The word of God alone should be and remain the only standard and rule of doctrine to which the writings of no man should be regarded as equal, but to which everything should be subjected. So based on this confession, let us open our worship in the name of the triune God of Scripture, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And you may take a seat, and we'll join together in singing hymn number 200 in those red hymnals, A Mighty Fortress is Our God.
I invite you to pick up that word of God that's in the pew and turn to page 990. There you'll find 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And we're going to be taking a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 37. That's page 990. So I did my vicar year as a seminary student down in Texas. And in Texas, I was speaking there with a rancher. And the rancher was telling me this story. He said to me, so one day, a DEA agent came to my property. So DEA in the States, that's drug enforcement. And the DEA agent came to my property and he said, I've got the right to look at your fields and look at your property. I'm going to check to make sure that you're not growing any illegal drugs here. And I responded to him and said, sure, you can do that, but don't go over there. Don't go over into that corner of the property. And the DEA agent, at that point, he exploded and he fumed and he said, I have the authority of the federal government behind me. And then he reached into his back pocket and he pulled out a badge and he put it right in my face. And he says, do you see this badge? It gives me the authority to go anywhere and everywhere on your property, no questions asked, no answers given. And so I stood back and said, okay, that's fine. And so I went back to my chores, working on the ranch. A little bit while later, I heard some screams and yelling coming from that corner, and I looked, and there running as fast as possible was that DEA agent taking off, and behind him was one of my bulls just charging him with his horns straight out. And I knew that he was going to gore him. And so I dropped my tools and I ran to the fence and I started yelling, your badge, show him your badge. <laughs> we like to poke fun at people in positions of authority, don't we? There's something about human nature where we really do have problems with authority and we like to sort it out on our own. And typically in history, the pendulum swings in two huge directions. On the one hand, 500 years ago in Luther's day, there was a debate that started on one topic, but that debate ended on a very different topic. It ended on this. If the Pope and the Bible say two completely different things, which one is the final authority? And back in Luther's day, there was a very strong contingent that said the Pope, one individual, he has ultimate authority to make these types of decisions. Today, though, the pendulum has swung all the way in the opposite direction. We live in a culture where we basically don't recognize any one individual as having authority, or better yet, we think every individual has complete authority over him or herself and no one else. And this ranges everywhere from hands off my guns to I'll decide what gender I am. Authority is something that we see in such extremes. And how was it that the pendulum swung from one position all the way to the other? Or better yet, the better question might be, how can we get that pendulum back to the middle, back to what we might call a Lutheran medal. Maybe part of the problem is that we associate authority with control and control with slavery. That when we say that the Bible is authoritative, what people hear is that that means is that the Bible controls us, that the Bible in some way enslaves. But what's interesting is if you step back and you actually read that Bible, there's not a whole lot of it that's dedicated to rules. In fact, if you look at it, the vast majority of the Bible is history on the one hand and prophecy on the other hand. A small part of it relatively says do this, but the vast majority of it is history that's telling us what has happened and prophecy telling us about what will happen. It's authoritative in a far greater way than simply saying this is what you must do. It's an account, first and foremost, of the fact that you can't do this. And then it is prophecy and fulfillment of God saying authoritatively that he has done it for us. What's coming in the future is not 
an authoritarian declaration to you of guilty, but instead it's an authoritative declaration of you are innocent. God's declaration of innocence is binding. His, de his decision that you are his child and his child alone, this is set in stone. It cannot be undone. And only once this, the gospel, is authoritative in your life, the love of God being authoritative in your life, only once you are able to say, how can I thank you, Lord, for all that you have done for me? Then he puts words into the mouths of his prophets, and he puts words into the mouths of his apostles who say this, a reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Verse 37, if anyone thinks they are a prophet or otherwise gifted by the Spirit, let them acknowledge that what I am writing to you is the Lord's command. This is the word of the Lord. At this point, I invite for the choir of divine word to sing for us.
My dear fellow Lutherans and future Lutherans, my text is just too long to mention. My text is an assortment of verses. To get my text, spend time in the Word. To get this text about Jesus, look at the biography of Jesus Christ. And if you've never cracked open your Bible, don't start and read it from cover to cover. Start with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four mighty Gospels, which tell of the birth, the ministry, and, and the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Word, the Word of Jesus works, and it worked from the very beginning. Jesus created this world. It says, in the book of John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. By Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. Jesus is the Creator. And His Word didn't need to be dressed up. His Word did not need gimmicks and all sorts of hoo His Word did not need a bunch of mystic incantations babbling on and on. Look what does it take, like, a page in the Bible, a little more than a page, to read of the creation of the entire universe? Jesus' word works. Let there be light. Let there be. 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 Okay. Jesus decided to become the incarnate word, the, the Son of God, the, the eternal Son of God is the word made flesh. And we're about to celebrate that soon, and Probably some of one of our favorite holidays uh, of the year, Christmas, when Jesus was took on a human nature, uh, even though he had been God from all eternity, he became one of us that he might be our substitute. Now Jesus' word runs the entire spectrum. His word runs the entire gamut, from small to huge. And I'm going to remind you of some of that. Remind myself right now. What was his first miracle in the book of John? And it says his first miracle was to turn water into wine at a wedding banquet, like near the end of the wedding banquet. Can you think of a more frivolous work? I don't mean that, and it would be blasphemous for me to say that. It was not frivolous. Jesus showed that by his simple command, he could... He could change the elements with his word without needing any kind of scientific intervention or, or magic wand or anything like that. Just a simple word of command. Just a simple word of thanksgiving, a simple meal prayer to his father was effective and powerful to feed 4,000 people plus women and children. 5,000 men plus women and children. Just that simple prayer of thanks. And, and I think of uh, the Lutheran Reformation, and, and I think of the Eucharist, which means thanksgiving. It's a meal where we, we give thanks to Jesus for salvation. And in the Eucharist, we receive Jesus' true body and blood, not in a symbolic way, not in a spiritual way, but in a real way. It's a miracle. And the opponents of Martin Luther said, well, how, how can Jesus do that? Uh, surely he would have been consumed by now. I mean, how much does a person weigh? How many times have Christians had communion um, throughout the ages? And, and they, they didn't think it was anything special. In fact, the, the elector of the Pal Palatinate, who was a Calvinist, took, took the host, threw it on the ground, and stomped on it and said, you telling me that that's my God? horrible. All they need to do is read the word. If Jesus was able to take a packed lunch and turn it into a meal for thousands with 12 basketfuls left over, is it any, is it difficult for him to feed his true body and blood to the church throughout the ages? The word of Jesus is effective to drive out demons. Come out of her. Come out of him. Be gone. 
And you know, I, sometimes I see these things on TV about exorcisms or whatnot, and they look pretty complicated. Um, Jesus didn't have to do a bunch of hocus pocus. Because his word, his simple word, was powerful enough to make Satan turn tail and flee. And that's what those last two verses of Mighty Fortress were all about. That word by which you also may tell Satan to turn tail and flee, and he must. Jesus, with a simple word of command, a simple word of orders, like a military commander, was able to save a life and to heal the centurion's servant. Remember that, that foreigner, that Roman, who came to the Jewish faith and was looking for the Savior? And he recognized that Jesus was the Son of God. And he said, Lord, I don't deserve to have you come to my house. Just say the word, make the orders, and you control nature. My servant will be healed. Uh, Jesus even spoke to the storms. Not with some crazy ritual, but with the simple, powerful word, be quiet, and the storm stopped. His word is powerful over nature. And Jesus' word was even effective when he went to visit his best friend. But his best friend was, was rotting already, He'd been in the grave for four days. They, Jesus said, roll, roll away that stone. Open up his grave. He said, Lord, Lord you're going to be shocked by the smell. Don't do it. He said, Lazarus, I say to you, come out. The power to raise the dead. And that word of resurrection had other power too. The power to raise dead souls. The power to create faith in a human heart that wasn't really a heart at all. Because when he raised Lazarus from the dead, many people put their faith in Jesus. They saw his power over death and they wanted to follow him. It, it, it was so effective that the Pharisees and teachers of the law wanted to murder Lazarus as well as Jesus because Lazarus was living proof of the power of Jesus' simple word. But my favorite example of the power of Jesus' word comes from the Gospel of Luke. We've not seen a change so rapid as what happened when Jesus was on the cross. There were two, two criminals being crucified on either side of them. And you know, they were both mocking him. They were both rejecting him and, and insulting him. But somewhere along that line, with the things Jesus said, with the way the incarnate word humbled himself to death he didn't deserve, somewhere in that time, literally the last hours of the guy's life, one of them came to faith in Jesus. The word is effective. Never give up. Never give up on that person you want to see in heaven because God's word is effective to the very end of their time of grace. And Jesus said, certainly you will be in heaven with me. And why? Why? Because of one final, solid, simple word. It's, a, it's a, a word of Jesus so simple that it literally is just one word in the original Greek of the New Testament. It's a, a three-word sentence in our English, but it was just one word. As he said, at the end of those three hours, tetelestai. It is finished. My work of glorifying the Father by redeeming his sinful creatures, by taking away all the world's sin, it's done, it's finished, no need to buy an indulgence. 
And as the word effected a very troubled monk named Martin Luther, as God's word sunk in, as God created a heart, a beating heart where there had been just a heart of stone before, when God showed Luther the power of his own love, the power of the cross, simple and unstoppable, When God made Luther a Christian, Luther had all the confidence he needed for that turmoil of the Reformation for the rest of his life because he understood the word, the simple word of God is so powerful that he said it's like a lion. All you need to do is open up the cage and let the lion out. He can take care of himself just fine. Praise Jesus, and and I look forward to hearing his words with my own ears on that resurrection day. And, And may you as well. God bless. And we sing, always get to sing my favorite Reformation hymn now, hymn 203, Lord, keep us steadfast in your word. Good afternoon. Dear fellow heirs of the Reformation, let that sink in. Inheritors of pure, unadulterated gospel love, grace, and mercy from your Father based on absolutely nothing that you have done or could possibly do is yours in Jesus Christ. To him be the glory forever and ever. And that's what we celebrate this day and actually every little mini Easter when we join together for worship on Sunday, but particularly for confessional Lutherans, today is a glorious day. I'm supposed to talk to you about the sufficiency of scripture. Let's listen to the Apostle Paul as he wrote to young Pastor Timothy From 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 15 through 17. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and what you have become convinced of. Because you know those from whom you learned it and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So far the word of the Lord. 
There is no one food that is all sufficient to supply you with every vitamin, mineral, carbohydrate, and protein, and fluid that your body possibly needs in order to keep you looking to be the epitome of, of humanity that you are. And there is absolutely not one all-sufficient medicine that can take care of every possible ailment that the human body can get inundated with. That's just not the way of the world. Or let me, let me turn it around and maybe try it this way. If I want to go uh, with Elon Musk to Mars, <laughs> first of all, I would be crazy. But just for argument's sake, if I wanted to go to Mars with Elon Musk, um, I would need years and years of training. I would need a spaceship that can get me through space safely, somewhat shielded from radiation, for anywhere from six to eight months, depending on when we took off. We would need enough food and oxygen and water-producing machinery to last us that period of time. And then, by a hope and a prayer, we might actually arrive at Mars because it takes all those things together to get you to that destination of Mars. And it's probably not unlike you young families feeling like you're packing the van when you just want to simply go to Gatineau Park. You've got like 42 pounds of stuff for your four children, you know? That's just the way of the world. But if I want to get to heaven, if you want to get to heaven, you don't need all that stuff. All you need is this. 66 books written by about 40 authors, because we don't really know who wrote Hebrews, who wrote Judges. Over 1,600 years, written from three continents, and it all has one unifying, consistent theme and message. The love of God for sinners revealed to us through his son, Jesus Christ. When we say that the scriptures are all sufficient, we are not saying that this is some kind of human encyclopedia of human knowledge, that it's some kind of textbook about agriculture or architecture or medical science. What we are also not saying when we say that scripture is all sufficient, we are not saying that Everything that Jesus taught or everything that the apostles said is recorded in this book. That's, that's not what we're saying. When we say that the scriptures are all sufficient, what we're saying is that it has a, a supernatural power. When it is properly preached, when it is properly taught, and when it is properly applied to the human individual, it has this ability to produce any and all spiritual results that God intends for the welfare of you. When we say that the scripture is all sufficient, we're affirming that everything possibly necessary for the salvation of sinners, for the sanctification or the purifying or the holifying of believers, but also for the carrying out of his very precious special ministry through his bride in the church, is all contained right here to make it successful. When we say that scripture is all sufficient, it has everything that a human soul needs for faith and for life. Psalm, 90, Psalm 19, verse seven, affirms the central truth when it declares, the law of the Lord is perfect, meaning it is whole, it is complete, it is lacking nothing that the soul needs in order to learn of the gift of salvation, that it is everything that a soul possibly could possibly want and need. It's a comprehensive treatment of God's truth. The scripture Paul writes makes the servant of God thoroughly equipped for every good work. So, 
Now the question comes, if you're a visitor here today, or maybe under six, how is all this possible from just a mere book? Well, because it's not just a mere book. Scripture possesses this supernatural ability, as we mentioned, the supernatural power to be able to connect to human hearts in a very special way. The Bible says of itself, for the word of God is alive and active. This book literally claims itself to be alive. It literally claims itself to be active, unlike any other book that you might read in the world. It contains divine life within these words. And what it does is it channels the love and the grace of a God who did not want to turn us into carbon spots. It channels that grace right into here and into here. It is always relevant. It is always timely. It is always fresh. It is never obsolete and is never stagnant. Martin Luther wrote, the Bible is alive. It speaks to me. It has feet. It runs after me when I am lost. It has hands. It lays hold on me. And this is where we start down the hill of this little devotion. This is where we round the corner from the academic and the didactic and the teaching to the personal. How does this apply to me? You see, for without the word, think of the consequences of that. Any possible superstition would be possible. Without the word, any conclusion would be equally valid between you and me. Without the word of God, any answer holds just as much water and just as much merit as anyone else's. Right? But with the code determiners of truth, if you mix that in, my worldview, my feelings, um, the traditions of the church, uh, the councils and the popes, even if we're going to put this in a historical setting, the councils and the popes, which, by the way, Luther said, often contradicted one another. What do all these other things do to the sufficiency of Scripture? They make it no longer all sufficient because now they have added or they have subtracted. We have essentially then diluted the all sufficiency of this word. Permit me another historical quote. And mind it well, if I may give you a gospel imperative. A Christian should know that nothing on earth, nothing, is more sacred than God's word. For even the sacraments themselves are made and blessed and sanctified by God's word. And all of us, too, are thereby, thereby born and consecrated Christians. So if this, as we confess, is all sufficient for faith and life, then let it be all superior in our faith and our life. Hold it always to be beholded, beheld by your eyes. Read it aloud to your children and let it fill your and their minds. Let it be cradled in your soul so that the truth which it yearns to reveal may be proclaimed day in and day out, moment by moment throughout those days, that yes, God in his grace, in his mercy, has made you a dear child, his dear child. You are forgiven. This is the truth that sets you free. Amen. We'll now be edified by our soloist.
This is the word of the Lord. That's right. Now I turned it on. Is that too loud? I'm a little loud. So. <laughs> the Bible is confusing. No matter how many times I read a certain passage, I just can't grasp its meaning. I wish the Bible was more clear. Have you ever felt that way? Wishing the Bible was more clear? I have to confess that I felt that way. But that invites the question. Is the Bible, in fact, unclear? Because we confess that the Bible is clear, clear enough for a child to understand its basic meaning. Do we, as many false theologians have claimed throughout history, need other resources like popes or councils or academic experts to tell us what the word really means, to get that hidden meaning, because it's so unclear? Well, the biblical answer to that question is no. So here's the truth. Whenever I have trouble understanding a section of scripture, the problem is not that the Bible is unclear. More often than not, the problem is my ignorance or my preconceived notions that muddy the clear understanding of the Bible. The scriptures are actually clear. So clear that they alone serve the basis of the true Christian faith with no other interpreter needed. With a little bit of an illustration of a place near here, we're going to consider these themes under the theme, the scriptures are clear. So don't be afraid to study them. And let those scriptures, those clear scriptures, lead you to Christ. Now, as many of you know, I'm pretty new to Ottawa. And when I travel Leitrim Road, I inevitably pass this weird compound structure place behind a large fence. And I can clearly see the buildings. I mean, they're clear to me. They're not hidden behind any camouflage canopy. They're there for everyone to see. But even though they are crystal clear to my eyes, I still have no idea what those buildings are. Well, similar to that Canadian Forces base in Leitrim, the Bible in no way hides its teaching. They're open for all to read on the pages of Scripture. But even though they are clearly visible, this doesn't mean that we immediately understand their purpose and meaning at first glance. The problem is not that the Bible is unclear, but we don't understand what we're seeing. This invites the question, well, how do we gain understanding and knowledge of the Bible so we can understand what we're reading? Well, the same way you find out what those weird buildings are at Leitrim Road, by reading the sign and listening to the people who operate the base. Now, there's not a lot of information about Leitrim Station. Well, actually, let me rephrase that. There's not a lot of official information about Leitrim Station on the internet. There's a lot of unofficial stuff. Sources claiming that the base does this stuff, that stuff, a lot, of, a lot of conspiracy theory going on. How can I tell who's telling the truth and who isn't? Well, the only way I can know for sure is if the commander of Leitrim Station gave me a tour of the base. Unfortunately, I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. But thankfully, the Lord is not like the government of Canada or the military of Canada. We don't have to rely on other people's theories telling us what the Bible is. Because God himself invites us to come into his word, to look around. More than that, he encourages us to spend as much time as we have possible in the Bible. He promised to send us a tour guide, the Holy Spirit, to guide and direct us in his word so that we might know what his word is all about. Now imagine for a moment that the government of Canada actually did invite us to go on to Leitrim Station. Imagine that the commander of that station gave us a guided tour and allowed, it, allowed us to explore the base. I don't think it would take all too long for us to gain an understanding of what the purpose of that base is all about and what the different buildings are for. At the same time, I know that I wouldn't understand how everything works in just one tour of that base. I would need to go back again and again and ask more questions, 
learning more about the technical details of how that base works. I would venture to say that I could live on that base my entire life and still not fully comprehend every technical detail of what goes on there. The problem is not a lack of clarity on the part of the base. The problem is a lack of knowledge on my part and my need to grow. And the same is true regarding the Bible. The scriptures are clear, so clear that even a child, an infant, as we heard in the last reading, from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, an infant can grasp the basic meanings of the Bible, and yet, yet there's so much there in God's Word that a lifetime of study will not mine out all understanding. Again, the problem is not with the Bible, it's with us. And so the, what's the best way for us to grow in our understanding of Scripture? It's by prayerfully, continually studying it. Now imagine for a moment, again, we're invited to Leitrim, and, and I saw something that looked like a Doppler radar. You know what a Doppler radar is? The, th that's the radar that actually looks and, and talks about precipitation for weather stations. Now imagine... I saw something that looked like a Doppler radar, and so I didn't look at the sign, I didn't look at anything, I just assumed that that was a Doppler radar, and I assumed that that base was a weather station base, that that's what it is about. I didn't bother to read any signs or ask any questions. Now imagine that I used that preconceived notion to tell other people that CFS Leitrim is nothing more than a weather station, when it in fact is something totally different. Whose fault is that confusing claim? Is it Leitrim's fault for being unclear? No. It's my own fault for making false assumptions and not paying close attention to what the base talks about itself. And the same is true regarding the Bible. Why are there so many different interpretations of Scripture that seem to contradict each other? Is it because the Bible is unclear in its teaching? No. Rather, it's because people don't pay close attention to what the Bible actually says, or they let their preconceived notions muddy the clear statements of Scripture. Let me give you an example of what I mean. There are many churches that teach that the bread and wine we get in Holy Communion are mere symbols of Christ's body and blood. We teach that the body and blood of Christ are actually present in with and under the bread and wine of Holy Communion. Well, who's right? Who's wrong? Can we ever know for certain? Yes, we can. Consider what Jesus says when he instituted the Lord's Supper. He said, this is my body. This is my blood. Those words are so crystal clear that a little child could understand them. The only thing muddying the waters of those statements are people's preconceived notions of how they want things to be. But as long as we carefully listen to the scriptures, submitting all things to what it says instead of what we think it should say, then scripture will speak in clarity. This is not to say that we're going to understand everything. We won't. But even if we don't understand, we still know the truth and believe. And the Holy Spirit uses the Bible to guide us in the way of truth, pointing us to Christ in everything. Now, in order to understand the purpose of those weird buildings I clearly see at Leitrim Station, there's a key piece of information I need to know. I can't go on with this, but I can get an understanding from this. According to a 2006 archived official government webpage, CFS Leitrim is a signal intelligence collection station. Well, this simple fact allows me to understand the purpose of the buildings of that base. I might not understand every piece of equipment on that base and what it would do, but I do know that in some way, everything on that base supports that mission of gathering signal intelligence. In a similar way, the Lord offers us an important key to understanding the scriptures, making them even more clear as we continually study the Bible and apply it to our lives. And what is that key? That key to the clarity of Scripture, it's found in what Jesus spoke to some Jews who questioned his authority. He said, you search the Scriptures because you think you have eternal life in them. They testify about me. In other words, the key to understanding the Bible and its purpose 
is that it all points to Jesus. It's all about him and the great lengths he went through to save us from our sins. Only in him do we find forgiveness. Only through repentance and faith in him do we receive eternal life. So brothers and sisters in Christ, while it is true that there are many difficult sections of, and passages in Scripture that we will never be able to fully comprehend the side of heaven, the fact remains, the Scriptures are clear. Don't be afraid to study them. Don't, don't be intimidated by them. Why? Because your Lord himself invites you to read, to learn, to grow in faith as you meditate on his word. More importantly, he promises you to send you the Holy Spirit and use the scriptures to lead you to Christ in all things. For it's this very purpose that he gave them. Amen. We will now continue with our singing of the next hymn, hymn 204. Let's join together in the litany of remembering on page four. Please stand. With grateful hearts, O Lord, that great cloud of witnesses whose living trust in you, recorded in your word, becomes an example for us to imitate and follow. 
With grateful hearts, O Lord, the reformers and confessors who faced the terror of church and empire, but stood firm in your truth because they were moved by grace, empowered by faith, and guided by scripture. With grateful hearts, O Lord, your faithful followers of every age, among them our own mothers and fathers, pastors and teachers, called, gathered, enlightened and sanctified by the Holy Spirit to be your church and by whose faithful witness the gospel of your grace has reached at last to us. With grateful hearts, O Lord, the early and present leaders of our church body, the teachers who trained our grandfathers and those who now teach us, the missionaries who once went to lands uncharted and unmapped, and those who now carry your word where we cannot go. With grateful hearts, O oh Lord, our own loved ones whose memories still burn within our hearts, whom you have called in your good time from their labors in life to that life which knows no end. To carry on their work in this our day, trusting your Son, holding to your word, confessing your truth, and reaching the lost with your love until you call us to join them where sadness and strife are swallowed up by everlasting joy. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another and serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and grant you his peace. let's remain standing as we sing our final hymn, God's Word is Our Great Heritage. Amen. Please be seated. Special thanks to Divine Words Choir, to Deb, to Krista, to Ruth, our organists. Let's just join together right now in the common table prayer, huh? Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest, and let these gifts to us be blessed. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Amen. We'll go downstairs.